All right. I think we're ready to get started. Mason, if you want to go ahead and allow folks into the waiting room while I'm starting, that would be great. Um, all right. So I just wanna welcome everyone to this event um, titled Gentrification and the Pandemic, uh, the, flight for, the Fight for Flushing. Um, my name is Lindsay Burfon. I'm an assistant curator at Queens Museum. Um, and I'm gonna be starting us off with a land acknowledgement um, today. Um, so I'd like to take a moment for land recognition. Um, Queens Museum is located in Flushing Meadows Corona Park in central Queens. We would like to acknowledge the Muncie Lenape, Canarsie, Lakawe, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities as stewards of the land and their past, present, and future generations. As both a museum of art and a historic site, built on unceded indigenous lands. Queen's Museum recognizes the continual di displacement of native people by the United States and is committed to working to dismantle the ongoing effects of this colonial legacy. Queen's Museum stands with all those advancing indigenous resurgence and decolonization. We honor and pay respect to the indigenous knowledge bearers that have and continue to live in deep connection to the land. And we invite you all to take action now by devoting time to taking care of the land, whether this looks like cleaning up your local park or donating to an indigenous led advocacy group. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Larissa Harris. Um, hello, everyone. So um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's, it's great to have so many people here. Um, um, thank you so much, Lindsay. And so gentrification in the pandemic, the fight for flushing is uh, part of a project by the artist Betty Yu, um, Resistance and Progress, which is currently on view at the, at the Queens Museum. Um, so I'm Larissa Harris and with the excellent staff at Queens Museum, organized the exhibition after the Plaster Foundation or Where Can We Live? It's a long name for a group show that includes Betty's project. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you have been to the Queens Museum. Uh, but at its heart is a 3,000 square foot model of the city of New York. And this model inspires a lot of the work that goes on by keeping the city always in our midst, like front of mind. Um, and the exhibition, Where Can We Live? is 12 artists asking people to think about property writ large, um, what are art and artists' roles in gentrification and how race impacts where people get to live and who is displaced. Um, and so there are works that are poetic and personal and satirical and symbolic and also works that are directly activist. Um, and Where Can We Live was supposed to open in April 2020. It finally opened in September. And almost a year into the pandemic, we see and experience how it has exacerbated every inequity in our society and housing, unfortunately, is no exception to this. Um, so it was Betty's work, Displacement in Sunset Park, an ongoing work she first exhibited in 2017, uh, which uses documentary video and VR and photography and mapping and tours um, to tell the stories of the changes in the Brooklyn neighborhood where she grew up and where her parents still live. Um, that, that's what prompted us, that project is what prompted us to invite her to make something new for the Queens Museum context. Um, so Sunset Park also is, um, is a Chinese and Spanish speaking community. And we saw a parallel in our own immediate neighborhoods of Flushing and Corona, which flank both sides of Flushing Meadows Corona Park where the, where the museum is located. Um, so Betty's new work, Resistance and Progress is made up of a video that profiles panelists, Shone Bion and Bobby Nathan, a timeline who you will meet very soon, um, a timeline of Flushing real estate, super interesting. Um, which starts before the col before colonization with the Matinecock tribe, a division of the Algonquin nation, and goes up to today, um, to which panelists Tari Hum and Shanabian contributed greatly, um, and a fantastic collage of four sale properties in Flushing and the conversation you're about to hear. Um, so everything on view at the museum is available in English, Korean, Chinese, and Spanish. And this, the recording of today's conversation um, will be made available with interpretation in Korean, Chinese, and Spanish in the new year. Um, so before we show a clip from the video and hand it over to Betty, I just wanna give a huge thank you to the panelists for taking the time amidst their very urgent work 
um, to give a picture of what they do, how, and why. Um, to everyone at Queens Museum who worked hard to assist Betty in making this project come alive. Um, and to Betty herself for her creativity and unflagging commitment to highlighting the incredibly important work of local organizers and putting their work, the larger context of New York and the world. Um, so a few housekeeping notes. Please set your sound to mute uh, until we open up to questions following the panelists' presentations. Um, then please use the chat function to submit your question and one of us will call on you. Or if you would rather, you can just write question, question in the chat and we'll call on you using your Zoom username. We'll call on you aloud using your Zoom username or phone number. Um, and if you're using the Zoom mobile app on your phone, click more on the bottom toolbar and you'll see the option for the chat feature. And please note that this event will be recorded and is being recorded right now. Okay, so lastly, a quick, Betty, a, a quick bio for Betty. <laughs> um, so Betty Yu is a multimedia artist, filmmaker, educator, and activist born and raised in New York City to Chinese immigrant parents. Um, Yu integrates documentary film, new media platforms, and community infused approaches into her practice. And she is co-founder of Chinatown Art Brigade, a cultural collective using art to advance anti-gentrification organizing. And here's a clip, a couple, two clips from Resistance and Progress after which Betty will take the reins. Thank you very much. I've been, um, going to door knocking and doing outreach to um, to rent stabilized apartment um, and then try to build like tenant association with people. Really? It's really diverse. So when I go to door knocking, I can't just use Korean and English. I have to translate all the materials into um, Chinese, typically Mandarin, because I, I see a lot of people who speak Mandarin. There is one building uh, owned by Khaled Management. Um, they have been charging rent stabilized tenants. Um, they have been charging them market rate rent for 30 years and most of the tenants who were affected by them um, were Korean. Rent stabilized building, um, now owned by a and &E. a and &E is the one of the worst landlord and, and predatory landlord in, in New York City. A lot of people in that building, they complain that there is a lot of noise, dust coming in. It's so bad for them and they, you know, a lot of them have like um, residents who's been there for a long, long time, they can't stand. The landlord doesn't fix um, issue, like repairs in the in houses. I think Flushing has the highest rate of converting the basement um, as well. So people go to attics and basement and things like that, but they don't know that it, they don't know that it's a displacement that they have been displaced. Um, we also see like a lot of homeless population growing. Um, when we go to libraries, there are a lot of like homeless brothers and sisters, we see them. A lot of people don't know about their housing rights and they have been displaced, but not knowing that it's a displacement. So whenever they get a letter from like, you know, MCI units saying that they're gonna get MCIs and blah, 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 or like landlord increasing the rent, they just pack everything and leave. And then if you look across here, you see the green fencing as well. Right. So you notice, it, and then if you look all the way down that block, there's green fencing. Out. Exactly. Green symbolize that they're doing roof work and facade work. It's a part of doing it to, so they can get the MCIs, major capital improvement. Uh, okay. And that's what people are fighting, right? The yeah. MCIs? Are, are we going to show the other one and then? Oh, yeah. According to New York Times article that recently came out, Flushing has been quietly becoming um, one of the fastest growing for sale market, um, second to the Williamsburg. And the price of condo um, jumped nearly like 86% from 2009 to 2019. So um, there has been a lot of speculation and the, I think it's really connected to the zoning. So this is the back of U-Haul. 
and this is Flushing River, also called Flushing Creek. I refer to it as the Doodle Water Creek because it's filled with nothing but polluted. It's just polluted. <laughs> and then the other thing is, when it rains, they discharge raw sewage in here, so it smells. You can actually smell it from where I live, the way it smells. And so I call it Doodle Water Creek. And this is where they want to build. And tell me about the, what's the special district? Three developers came together. They want to build 11 block, um, 1725 luxury condos and hotels in, in this site by the Flushing Creek. They're, uh, they will get tax benefits. Um, they want to get tax benefits by building affordable, affordable housing, but it's not really affordable to the Flushing community. If they clean it up, they might even disturb more contaminants than is actually we that's actually like above, it's close to the surface. So they are like they they're not sure if they should clean it up or not because they might do more harm than good when they start to clean it up. They they didn't come up with the environmental impact studies, so we don't actually know how this um, this this uh, this rezoning plan will affect um, beyond few blocks away from here right um, and it whole whole site that they want to rezone they're in the uh, flood plan so it's gonna flood but they still want to build it everything is on the flood plan all of this all of this whole... and they want to build luxury yes where the green is is where the, the flood line is whenever the high tide it's high tide the water goes all the way up to the green mark so if there's a flood it's gonna be three times as high, so you can see it will, it will, the whole entire area will be flooded. And so at the hearing, I had asked them, how are the people gonna get into the building when it's flooded out? Will they provide boats or it will be like Venice? Okay. Um... So I just wanted to say a few uh, remarks before I, I toss it over to our featured speakers and then hopefully we'll have a really uh, fruitful um, discussion about moving forward and organizing strategy um, and all of that. Um, but first, I just wanna thank Larissa and the Queens Museum for the opportunity to create and showcase this really important anti-gentrification fight that is literally happening right now. You may all know that this morning there was a city council subcommittee vote on the waterfront and also, um, and they voted yes, of course, a huge disappointment. And then there's a final vote tomorrow. The panels will get uh, much more uh, into it. Um, and it was a real pleasure to work with Sine and, and Bobby who are both with uh, Min Kwan Center for Community Action and longtime uh, Flushing residents. I really appreciate all the time they took to spend with me and their patients. They shared their personal stories of immigrating to the US, um, both actually as teenagers and creating a sense of home in Flushing and the importance of this fight uh, against luxury um, housing and against this uh, waterfront um, rezoning. Uh, so we know that this fight is not just about flushing or it's not even just about Queens. It's about that fight. It's about the fight for the future of our city and our, of our communities. So they also share hopes and dreams for the future of flushing. Um, one that is truly serving the interests of working class residents. Um, I also want to take a moment and just thank Professor uh, Tari Hum for being an advisor in this project. Her research and expertise is so vital. Um, and you could check out the videos um, in the exhibition in the different languages. This was just a, a four and a half, five minute clip that you saw. Um, and I think we'll, we'll be putting this, uh, the links into the, into the chat if you haven't, if that has not been done already, because I'm not looking at the chat right now. Um, but as, Liz, as Larissa mentioned, um, there is also a timeline that's a central part of the installation. Um, and uh, Professor Ham Sene, along with a Queens College social practice student, Christina Ferrigno were really incredibly helpful in their input in helping to design it, uh, design the timeline, which again starts uh, uh, with pre-colonization and the Manitinkak Man 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 <laughs> First Nation to the current rezoning fight in Flushing. Um, and, and, and you'll see, I'm not sure if you can advance to the next slide, Mason. 
Um, yes. Uh, so this here um, is a part of the, um, the exhibition and it's entitled uh, Speculating Flushing 2020 uh, Real Estate Boom for Who? Um, and it's a mixed media piece that really combines um, real estate advertisements and reproductions of actual postings from makeshift bulletin boards um, in, the, in, in a flushing laundromat, in the supermarket. These were pre-COVID uh, sort of um, pictures that I, I took of, of, of these um, bulletin boards um, and the magazines were from February and March. I think there were like five or six real estate um, magazines that you can get, right? It's crazy um, in uh, Chinese and Korean and English. And so landlords and homeowners post their handwritten um, advertisements seeking individuals and couples and sometimes families to rent one room in their apartment or house. And of course the average cost of a home from all of these displays is about uh, $950,000, right? And the average uh, income of a Flushing family is about 41,000. Um, so you can see the, that it's not, it's, not, it's not designed for people who live in Flushing. Um, and so obviously we're seeing skyrocketing rents everywhere, all over the city. Um, and even um, with this pandemic, um, you know, they're trying to fast track this, this um, rezoning, not just in uh, Flushing, but in Sunset Park and, and other places as well. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there is um, also a, a people's bulletin board displaying information um, about the anti-gentrification uh, fight and affordable housing efforts that are uh, underway in Flushing and throughout New York City. Um, and I finally want to just mention on a personal note, this work is really tied to the, to the larger fight in the city, like I said, and comes from my own experience in anti-displacement work. Um, and I want to say that um, if you go to the next slide, I, I really want to sort of uh, thank um, Tari, Professor Tari Hum and Sam Stein, who uh, their work is featured on each, each the show. Each artist has like a resource page, um, and you can actually read some excerpts um, from these two scholars who I really admire, who really write about the systems of gentrification and how they're driven by the state and capitalism. Right, that these are systems that are designed to exploit right um, gentrification and rezoning uh, as of now. And so um, I really just have so much admiration for their work. Um, and, and that's featured on that resource page as well as uh, videos and some other, some other, um, some other work. Um, and then finally, if you go to the next picture, the last one, I think, uh, this is um, my parents' block that's being uh, rapidly transformed. Yes, even during COVID, there are two new condos going up um, and this is in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, and so they're uh, in the neighborhood, very similar to what's happening in Flushing and, and, all, and really all over um, the city is that they're, um, trying to demolish these two uh, story homes and building larger luxury housing um, that are not designed for people like my parents. Um, and so I think that that along with, um, you know, the, um, the organizing that has been happening against uh, gentrification even long before COVID, it's important to note that these three Chinatowns, the one in Brooklyn that I grew up in and Flushing and, and Manhattan's Chinatown are all, uh, and inextricably tied together. Um, and so long before the pandemic, right, there's been these exp expedited rezonings and of course now continued anti-Asian COVID racism. And so really thinking about what does this future hold for our communities right now at this time when things have not slowed down and they are accelerating and people are suffering economically and um, aren't able to pay the rent and don't know how they're gonna put food on this table. Um, and so a shout out to the folks who defeat it uh, Industry City's expansion in Sunset Park. Uh, but as for, for some of you probably know, it was a waterfront luxury housing uh, um, complex they wanted to build. And it was really because residents packed the Zoom hearing for 12 hours. Similar to, I know the flushing hearings have been really long too. They, they really showed up and um, showed the developers that, that they didn't want this. So um, I'm gonna get right into it. Our, um, our first speaker is Tari Hum. I'm gonna read short a shorter version of each uh, person's bio, and then we'll put the longer one in chat in the chat. Um, so Tari Hum is a professor and chair of the Department of Urban Studies at Queens College and a member of the doctoral uh, faculty at the CUNY Graduate Center. She's an urban planner and author of Making a Global Immigrant Neighborhood, Brooklyn Sunset Park, and a lead co-editor of a forthcoming volume, Immigrant Crossroads, 
Globalization, Incorporation, and Placemaking in Queens, New York. So please uh, give a virtual applause to Tari Hum. Thank you, Betty. And thank you uh, to the Queens Museum um, for the very generous introduction and for um, inviting me to participate uh, on this panel. Um, I think that if we can get the first slide up, then I, I can get started. Okay, great. Um, so I think that my, my talk, uh, my 10 minutes, I'm gonna focus on the state actions um, that have been taken in the contemporary past that have dispossessed um, Flushing's working class, uh, Flushing's African-American community that really kind of sets the context for, um, for how uh, city planning um, and how these rezonings really advance uh, uh, private property and real estate development developers, you know, investments and interests. So um, this slide just shows that Flushing really is a tale of two cities in one neighborhood. Um, you, uh, uh, Sone in the uh, video clip mentioned the article uh, that described how um, Flushing um, in the past decade had the second highest uh, volume of new luxury condominium construction in the city after Williamsburg, and it was only by 126 units. So in the past decade, uh, there were over 3,000 units that were ultra luxury units that were added to the Flushing um, housing market. And then on the other hand, and these are both articles that appeared in 2020, um, there's um, an article about how uh, one of Flushing's uh, largest food pantries, La Jornada, you know, uh, as a result of the pandemic had just um, huge queues. And um, La Jornada actually exemplifies how for real estate developers, uh, they might be willing to give a little charity because I know that they donated turkeys and they set up a GoFundMe site to raise money for La Jornada. But in terms of addressing the systemic and the structural causes of inequality and hunger and housing precarity, that is not in their interest to do. Next slide. I wanted to talk about, uh, I think that what is happening uh, with regard to uh, the Flushing uh, Special uh, Waterfront District um, actually originates um, in a 2004 downtown Flushing framework. It actually has a longer history than that, but the most kind of contemporary history again is uh, during the Bloomberg administration, shortly after he was elected, he and Deputy Mayor Dan Dokteroff uh, convened a downtown Flushing task force that was comprised of the Immigrant Growth Coalition, which included the local electeds, uh, business leaders, property owners, et cetera, and essentially developed this plan, which the New York City Economic Development Corporation always prefaces it as a result of organic planning, um, you know, just to try to convince, I think, the public that there was some, that there was community buy-in. But in any case, um, it, uh, the plan links the downtown flushing, and in particular, the municipal, the municipal parking lot site, which is here, with the Flushing waterfront and Willits Point. And these so-called underutilized sites were linked together in a plan to basically try to achieve a higher standard of development uh, in the area. Next slide. This, um, this is actually, uh, this is a map of by um, the Federal Homeowner Loan Corporation, um, which was an agency that was formed um, during the New Deal. And it was established to provide financial assistance to homeowners. Um, and part of what it did, and of course it was, you know, white homeowners, but um, part of what they, the strategies that they used to assess lending risk is uh, that they worked with local appraisers and real estate developers to kind of grade the level of risk of neighborhoods for 
uh, loans in terms of issuing mortgage loans. This is where you uh, can This is where the term redlining comes up because those areas that are drawn in red, and we can see that downtown Flushing, including the municipal parking lot site, is was redlined. And these, this meant that these were high risk areas, highly undesirable for any kind of investment. And largely these zones were uh, drawn based on the racial demographics. So redlined areas meant that these were areas with significant African-American populations. Next slide. So this is, um, so the municipal parking lot is block the 5.5 acre municipal parking lot site is a block 4978. And these were photographs that were taken during the late 1930s, early 1940s uh, by the Works Progress Administration. They worked with the New York City Department of Taxation uh, from 1939 to 1941 uh, to basically take photographs of every, of all buildings on every tax lot in New York City. And you can see here that, you know, uh, downtown, that block 4978, which is downtown Flushing, you know, um, it's, it's modest, but it's certainly not a blighted, dilapidated area. Um, and Flushing, downtown Flushing has had a long standing um, African American uh, community uh, dating back to the 1850s. Um, in fact, I think it was very similar in terms of the kind of the mixture of African-American and Irish population, much like Seneca Village in Central Park before that community was destroyed to establish the park. Okay, next slide. So on block 4978 um, is um, the um, AME Church. And, and this photograph shows um, a fairly, well, a, a picture that was probably, a photograph probably taken in the mid 2000s. Um, and you can see that the Macedonia AME Church, which is a church that dates back to 1811 in downtown Flushing, it anchors that municipal parking lot number one site, which, um, which was during the 1950s, I forgot to mention, as a result of urban renewal, uh, that block 4978 was basically destroyed in order to build this experimental municipal parking lot number one. So this was the first experimental parking lot that was established by the city off street to generate um, revenue for the city but also to serve a suburban um, a commercial, I mean, a suburban uh, consumers. And um, so this was the site. Uh, so all of the, the families that were living on block 4978, which we saw photos of earlier, were basically uh, displaced. And Jay Williams um, is currently, is still a Flushing resident. He was the church historian for the AME Macedonia Church. And in his oral history, which is archived in the Queens Library, he describes how his family, which were from Detroit, Michigan, as well as um, he's part Shinnecock. So his ancestors included um, uh, members of the Shinnecock Nation that settled in Fl Flushing. He describes how his family was forced by eminent domain to leave their homes, to sell their homes. Um, they, he felt that, he, that it, they did not receive fair compensation, but that whole community was basically dispossessed except that the church remained anchoring the site. Next slide. Um, I think, did we miss a slide with the church? Maybe. Um, no, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so this is uh, what the municipal parking lot um, ultimately uh, became. So um, in 2010, uh, Bloomberg um, administration issued um, an RFP for the municipal parking lot um, and selected f &T Group, which is also one of the three developers of the Special Flushing Waterfront District 
sold it below um, market value at $20 million. Uh, in addition to a below uh, market value sales price, uh, the developers also received tax abatements uh, for the commercial space as well as the residential space. Um, I think that one of the, the, one of the benefits was supposed to be um, a 1.5 acre town square and a new home for the YMCA, which is in phase two and has not yet materialized. Now, just keep in mind a 5.5 acre site that was sold to private developers without any substantive real public benefit. Next slide. So this is what Flushing Commons is um, advertised as now. It advertises the most distinguished address in Flushing uh, because of the luxury condominiums that are part of that complex. And then here is um, a open space, which actually is Flushing's only uh, privately owned public space. It's listed by the New York City Department of Parks as a privately owned public space. You can see that um, there is very little active use of that space, but that is, it appears that that is where the, um, the city is kind of moving towards uh, privately managed um, public space. And they favor developers who provide these open spaces um, but they are privately owned and privately managed. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the Macedonia AME Church had anchored 4978, which was the heart of the of Flushing's historic Black community that ultimately became the municipal parking lot that now is Flushing Commons, this luxury condominium development that was uh, developed and financed by transnational developers. This is the photograph of the, um, the church um, in the late 1930s. And then this is a marker um, noting the historic significance of the church as a possible stop on the Underground Railroad. It is part of Flushing's free, uh, Freedom Mile, um, but there's a construction wall because that church, this historic church um, has been demolished. It was sold to developers and it was financed through a real estate crowdfunding entity that basically raised you know, nominal amounts of investments from people in China to kind of collectively finance the sale of this, um, of this site. Next site, next slide. So this brings us to the special Flushing Waterfront District because this is now the second site in Flushing. We had the municipal, the municipal parking lot, number one, which became Flushing Commons, and now we have the waterfront. So the special Flushing Waterfront District, uh, Sonne um, and Bobby described um, in, the, um, in the video is uh, an initiative by three developers, including FNT, who developed Flushing Commons, and then um, uh, Young Nian LLC, which is a transnational, which is a, um, a subsidiary of a Shanghai based real estate conglomerate and United Construction and Development, which is also a Flushing based um, developer, uh, but they are financed with tra um, transnational uh, real estate financing. So this proposal includes 13 towers a massive building basis, adding 3 million square feet of luxury residential and retail space. All of the proposed towers except for two will exceed the FAA, the FAA height restrictions in the primary approach path to LaGuardia Airport, which is less than two miles away. As Sonne noted, it is over 1,700 luxury residential condominiums, which is more than half of the total number that was added in flushing over the past decade. It includes a private street network and private extensions of existing map streets. And it also includes a privately managed waterfront promenade and open space. Now we already saw the track record of FNT in terms of the quality of privately owned uh, public space that they provide. But in any case, it totals a little over three acres which is just 
0.3% more than what is, what is required by um, the, the current zoning and the waterfront access plan. So it is not out of generosity that they are providing any kind of open space. And then the final slide. So this is, um, I think that I'm ending with the slide because the, here is Peter Koo um, at a rally opposing um, the establishment of the Flushing Busway, which would basically designate a main street between Northern and Sanford um, as a bus only lane, designate one of the lanes as bus only. And we know that uh, working people, everyday New Yorkers, they rely on public transit to go about their business, et cetera. Well, he opposes it because he claims that the interests of the Main Street businesses uh, matters more. And in fact, he appropriated uh, Black Lives Matter to chant Business Lives Matter, uh, really tone deaf. But I think that this also, um, symbolizes, um, again, the tendency or the um, emphasis on privately managed um, public spaces, um, privately managed streets. Uh, Peter Koo was also responsible for banning street vendors in downtown Flushing, only in his city council district. He's the only city council member that has done that. And um, I think it's really amounting to a privatization of Flushing's pu public realm, such that there's going to be like little fortress enclaves that define the Flushing neighborhood. And there. Great, thank you so much, Tari. That was a great, like, uh, I don't know how you did it in about 10 minutes. Did I, <laughs> did I stick to the 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, you cool. did. You, you packed in a lot. It's, it's great. And we'll be coming back to some of what you brought up. Fantastic. Thanks for the historical sure. you know, context and all of that. Um, okay, so uh, the, our next speaker, um, and I'll read a, a short bio um, about him. Um, so Bobby Nathan, uh, who's, also, who's one of the featured um, activists uh, in the videos. Uh, Bobby Nathan is a longtime Flushing resident and housing rights act activist. Nathan has been actively involved with community groups like Ming Kwan Center for Community Action in organizing efforts to fight luxury housing development and the displacement of longtime low-income Flushing residents. He is also a volunteer with the La Jonada Food Pantry. So please uh, give a virtual welcome applause to Bobby. Hi, everybody. My name is Bobby Nathan. I've lived in Flushing for the past 40 years. Uh, I came here as a teenager. Uh, we first moved to Franklin Avenue between Maine and Casino Boulevard. When we got there, Flushing at the time was predominantly white and Jewish. In fact, it was so white that the first time they saw me in the elevator, people wouldn't get on the elevator with me. So that's how Flushing was. Uh, when I went to school with my aunt, people didn't believe that she was my aunt because my, you know, I'm mixed. So people would ask me if that was my mom and how come my mom was so light and I was so dark because that was Flushing at the time. I've watched Flushing change to become predominantly Asian. And so most of y'all don't know this, but I'm also part Asian as well. And so I consider myself an African-American mutt and I'm very comfortable here in Flushing because of the diversity and what Flushing has done for me as a migrant. So, when we came here, it was my brother and myself. We were teenagers when we first got our first apartment, working as stock boys. That's how affordable Flushing was. And so this is one of the reasons why I fight for Flushing, because I've seen what it has done for poor immigrants to come here and become very successful. So when I got here, as I just said, it was white and Jewish. Then it became Korean at the time when I remember the first store that came on Main Street that was Asian. It like a lot of Europeans wouldn't wouldn't buy anything in that store. 
when Asian people started moving into the block, people would call the police on them because they would sit in front of the buildings. The buildings I live in, in particular, a lot of the kids used to run in the hallway and they would call the police. Then people would, would sit in the lobby in their pajamas and they would call the police. My building has a tenants association and they would have a meeting once a month. They started to have a meeting almost every week complaining about the noise, the kids running around in the hallway, a lot of things. So it is, it's like I've seen fashion change to where you, it's, it's like so diverse. It's a beautiful thing. As Mayor Dinkins would say, it's like the gorgeous mosaic right now. And so we need to keep it like this. So uh, downtown Flushing was always, I had a lot of black people because downtown Flushing is bordered by what they call Sanford Avenue, uh, College Point Boulevard, Northern Boulevard and Union. So we have a lot of like buses down here and the planes go at, it's like it's lowest point to land into LaGuardia. So people really didn't want to live in downtown Flushing because it was too noisy. But then in 2015, when Mayor de Blasio became mayor, it's like he said he was gonna rezone Flushing. And so Flushing started to change. We noticed that people were harassed, the water st stopped working in the buildings, the heat stopped working in the buildings. Uh, then we had a uh, treetop development came in and bought like eight buildings here in downtown Flushing. They took out the lights in the hallway. They, they, they shut off the heat. They shut off the water almost every day. Say they were working on it. And they made the buildings unlivable. Actually, Peter Ku actually went into a couple of the buildings with me to do a knock to tell people know their rights because people were just being pushed out left, right, and center. So for example, they had one building, 132-40 Sanford Avenue. That building has 92 units. They had kicked out almost 26 uh, families out of the apartment. They even call ice on the, the, the tenants here in Flushing. So it started, the, the gentrification started from like 2015. And we watched as people became even more desperate. When you went into the library, you would see like you couldn't find a seat in the library because it was being taken by people who normally live next door to you without living in, in the library. You went into Flushing Meadow Park, people were showering by the fountain. Under the Van Wick, people were sleeping under the Van Wick. And this is what Flushing has become because of gentrification. At first we were feeding La Jornada where I volunteer. We were only feeding 600 people. Uh, mostly all elderly Asian women and men. Uh, I've watched this to, to see, you couldn't find an empty apartment here in Flushing, really. Now you walk down the street, all you see is for rent. This is before the pandemic. For rent, for sale, land for sale, will be by cash for land. This is, you can't walk down any black in, in downtown Flushing before the pandemic and not see stuff like that because everything here is for sale. Professor Hum mentioned churches. Right now we have five churches for sale. It's insane what's going on here. And then the pandemic hit and it was like, as Don Pedro would say, a tsunami. We, we were feeding 10,000 people every week. We went from working on a Saturday only to work four days a week now. It's insane what's going on here in Flushing to see so many people are desperate for food. The lines before, as I said, was mostly Asian men and women. Now you have European, young European families on, on the line, young Latino families with kids on the line because they cannot afford to buy food. We have homeless on the street now. Before we had the homeless like in the background, in the shadows, in the park, under the Van Wick. Now we have homeless people sleeping in the vestibules of the bank. They are sleeping on Main Street. 
They are sleeping in the churchyard at my church of St. George's. They sleep in the doorways to get some heat. And this is this is what the pandemic has caused here in Flushing. To F and T for me, they bought all the they, they took the Muni lot and they said they were gonna build community space and mm -hmm. we were gonna have a lot of things. When they built it, we didn't get anything. In fact, they had promised the church when they built Queen's Crossing that we, the church would be able to use their parking facilities on Sundays that never materialized. And I'm saying to, to, to people like, if they would lie to a church, who wouldn't they lie to? And, and they promised stuff, but they never get it done. They told us that the YMCA was gonna be in there. Well, after years and years, the YMCA finally came out and said they weren't going in there. So they, they will not be a YMCA in, in, in where the Mutant lot is. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. So thank you. Thanks so much, Bobby, for that heartfelt um, uh, talk, presentation. Um, we'll be looping back with questions, of course. So if you have anything that you wanted to add, um, you'll have some time later. So um, our next speaker um, is uh, Sarah on. So I'll just read a short bio and then we'll put the longer one in the chat as well. So Sarah Ahn has been active in organizing with Korean, Chinese, and Latino workers at Flushing Workers Center since 2014. Flushing Workers Center has been fighting wage theft and sweatshop conditions facing workers and is now actively fighting to lower rents and limit the development of luxury condos in our community. She lives and works in Queens. So please give a round of a virtual applause to Sarah. Um, thank you so much, Betty. Um, it's really hard to follow after you, Bobby. Um, you always kind of make me want to cry a little bit. So, um, But um, I am actually um, going to start by sharing a video that we just put out earlier this week. Um, I wanted to, yeah, I just thought um, it, it does a good job of uh, why we're in this fight. So. Flushing is home to almost 200,000 residents. We are a diverse working class community. For generations, Flushing has served as the first stomping grounds for immigrants from all over the globe. It is also home to a historic black community that can trace its roots back to the Underground Railroad. All of Flushing's diverse communities have built and made Flushing the vibrant, culturally rich neighborhood it is today. But our community is under threat of being destroyed. This pipe application shares the potential to transform an isolated and polluted landfill into an activated waterfront community with open space, playgrounds, and a 40 foot promenade open to the public. Developers and council member Ku are seeking permission from the city to rezone and create a special district so they can build 13 more towers up to 23 stories high with 1,725 more condos, another hotel, and expensive retail and commercial space our small businesses cannot afford. I believe the proposal has many merits. What will be the cost? In the last 10 years, Flushing saw the second most condo construction in New York City after Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Developers like FNT Group have taken over our supermarkets, parking lots, houses of worship, and countless buildings, destroyed what was there, and replaced with condos. All of this unchecked development and predatory landlords swooping into our community has resulted in our rents and property taxes skyrocketing. A lot of landlords are abusing, charging extra rent that most people, especially seniors, they cannot pay. It. The average rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Flushing is now $2,000. 
the median household income for Flushing residents is $41,000. 最合适的上面就是我们这些工人啊，这些非常非常惨的。At the end of the day, whatever is ultimately built will need to enhance the downtown Fushun community and open up the currently inaccessible waterfront as realistically as possible. Luxury 개발은 이렇게 상류층의 사람들 they don't care about the people; they just care about to make more money. 这些利益集团建了很多的豪华的高楼，为什么政府部门不太管这个事情呢？这是官商勾结啊，导致了最后受伤的是老百姓。就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样，就这样
um, a vision, a plan that will benefit, you know, I, mean, I don't want to just repeat the, the video, but really that that says that this, again, is our community and we should have a say over uh, what gets built in our community. So I'll pass it on to Sana from here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, I think a few people are asking about the video and if we could put the link in. I don't know if, it, if it's uh, public or not, or if it was unlisted. So we'll put the, uh, I think one of us, me or Lindsay, we can find the link or if you wanna pop it in, Sarah. And also just a reminder that, um, uh, the, I don't know if folks logged in late, but there also are the videos from the show um, that are obviously was like a half hour long and I was only able to show four or five minutes. So if that is helpful at all for organizing tools like this film and you know the other ones, and I know Global Action Project actually made another one with Sine and uh, Ming Kwan we'll probably put that in the chat as well that uh, please, please use it and spread it uh, widely. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, last speaker. Um, and um, again, I will read a shorter um, bio and then we'll put the full full one in um, the chat. Um, so our final speaker um, is Sine Beyond. Um, and she um, organizes multicultural and multi-generational tenants in Flushing at Ming Kwan Center to fight against predatory, uh, predatory equity uh, and for economic justice. She's also a founding member of the Flushing Anti-Displacement Alliance, known as FADA. Before this role, she organized NYCHA tenants at CAV to build uh, grassroots power across low-income and working-class Asian immigrant communities in New York City. Additionally, she's uh, produced and directed an independent documentary, Owning, that it engages issues facing Native American reservations. So please give a huge virtual applause to Sine. Thank you for being with us. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for hosting Queens Museum and Betty. Um, I want to briefly explain that Ming Kwan Center, I'm organizing, um, I'm the lead housing organizer at Ming Kwan Center, and our center is a community-based organization founded in Flushing um, in 1984. And we empower, uh, the center empowers immigrants and Flushing communities to achieve economic and social justice for all. Um, and I think the previous panelists said really well um, and describe a lot of like issues that we have been going through but I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we you know this is like we are still in we're still grieving um, because of pandemic and the aftermath of pandemic right um, when you know during the peak of COVID-19 COVID um, you know our neighbors and our, our loved ones passed away um, our members passed away, hundreds of seniors passed away at the nursing home in Flushing. Um, like people mentioned before me, um, 10,000 10, people would line up at the food pantry. A lot of people um, and residents in, in Flushing, they have, uh, they, are, they have cash jobs, they are tip workers, and a lot of people lost their jobs during the pandemics. And um, some of them would have to like they've they they are being forced to collect like bottles on the streets um, all the supermarkets were closed at some point in downtown Flushing and um, actually um, you know some of the folks from FADA Flushing Anti-Displacement Alliance we wrote an op-ed about it how how luxury rezoning would worsen the food insecurity and inequalities in Flushing because Years before COVID nineteen, food mar like markets um, that sells food, fresh like vegetables and food, they were closed because of gentrification. Um, in fact, executive director of the local food pantry La Hornada said um, in the articles and and I believe in the um, during the radio show, um, he mentioned that the the cause of food insecurity in Flushing is gentrification. Despite, you know, residents continue to grieve and suffer for, through the pandemic, um, the city, our city, finds it in, uh, very appropriate to force the structural development upon the community and to resume the approval process. Um, I want to say that we have been muted. 
we have been muted throughout this process, um, especially after pandemic, when they start doing the virtual hearings. <laughs> so participating in a virtual hearing during this crisis is simply out of reach, especially for low income, limited English proficiency senior tenants. So according to the controller's office um, report, 41% um, of Flushing families do not have access to Wi-Fi. Um, so it was simply out of reach, but they are still continuing to do this EULA process um, on, on the, you know, using the virtual platform. And it was really upsetting. Um, we were stripped for this opportunity to hold our council member accountable to, um, you know, those who are most impacted due to the pandemic because um, our council member Ku would not meet with us because we were against the plan, right? Um, so while us residents continue to grieve and suffer through this pandemic, city council shouldn't have even started this EULA process, but they did. Um, and I also want to briefly mention that uh, this EULA process, like everyone said, doesn't have the environmental impact study. So community organizations and individuals from Flushing are suing the mayor's agencies for cutting um, environmental impact studies uh, for the applications. Um, this group called Fed Up Coalition, a lot of members, many of the members from the Fed Up Coalition is actually doing the, doing the lawsuit. And we're discussing this opportunity too, but since the council voted to approve um, the application, even if they know that this application doesn't have environmental impact study and which is huge, huge error in this, in this process, where we'll, our group will, is exploring an option to add the city council as a party to, to the lawsuit. So we are not only that we're not only we are suing the mayor's agencies, but also we are exploring the options to sue the council member as well. Oh, sorry, council, the council as well. It would be a shame being sued by community organizations and residents about their huge, huge errors. But they are forcing this plan even if there is huge errors, right? So, you know, this conversation with the residents and small business owners and and people in Flushing should have happened before the Yula process has process begun. But the concerns of our uh, of our community community um, community has never been listened to by by the council members and in in the throughout the Yula process. It's been really really hard. Um, so a lot of people ask me, and I I was also thinking about the same thing. Why do we need to participate at this Yula process? That's 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 like a show to many people, right? So I, I start calling for the citywide no rezoning meetings. Many neighborhoods throughout the city um, re reply back to me, and they have been joining. We have been you know talking about the issues in our neighborhood and how to respond, how to collectively build powers together to fight back to this absurd process. Um, so I don't know if you can show. Um, the the flyer now. I yes, it's, it's up now. Okay, yeah, great. Now. Yeah. <laughs> so, developers don't have borders, right? Um, they are all over the place. As developers from the Flushing could decided that they're gonna build something in Jamaica, they can decide to build some. You know, go to other neighborhood and build it. They don't have borders. But why, when we're fighting, because you love process. Why, why do we have to fight within our neighborhoods in a way that it's really oppressing to the communities, right? Um, so, you know, we, we came together um, and we're going to have press conference. We are going to demand that to stop waterfront giveaways and neighborhood giveaways, stop all racist rezoning throughout the city. Um, and stop all the virtual hearings that's violating our First Amendment rights. Um, and um, I just also want to mention that 
uh, FADA, Flushing Anti-Displacement Alliance. We have been collecting petitions. Uh, we have been, you know, doing outreach, and we collected uh, more than thousand people's signatures. Um, and we were able to deliberate yesterday to Peter Ku, but Peter Ku insisted that he wasn't there. Right? He wasn't there um, at the office, and he didn't meet with us um, to the end. Um, I also just want to mention, I want to sum up my uh, presentation by saying that this rezoning, this flushing rezoning is a developer driven rezoning, not community driven, and it's very destructive. Our downtown flushing communities have been bearing the burden of this environmental racism and have been suffering from the displacement due to the, the predatory development um, that has been going on for decades. Uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah, decades. Um, we should not have to suffer at the whims of greedy developers. We want flushing to be for the people. We flushing has been a place where immigrants and low-income people could feel their power and courage and comfort, find comfort. I hope this would be the same continually, um, so we can continue to fo foster this type of environment and fight for our neighborhoods. So our upcoming, um, so my presentation is done, but for the next step, um, we are having this press conference with the citywide group um, next Wednesday. Um, this uh, next Wednesday actually marks one year um, since we started, um, the flush, since the flushing rezoning started. Um, wasn't planned it, but it happened to be that way. <laughs> but we're having it, having the press conference at noon, um, at the city hall. Uh, please help with the lawsuit if you want to help us out. Um, please contact us, and also if you would could sign up to volunteer with Fada, it would be really really awesome. Uh, please search um, Act Dot Fight Four Number Four Flushing um, online, and you will be able to find ways to connect with us and yeah. please contact your council member <laughs> to say no to this rezoning and also the mayor thank you Sine. i put a whole bunch of links um uh in the chat so for folks who want to write their city council members since there's a full vote tomorrow and then the um, link to fada um, which I think links to everything else. So <laughs> thank you so much, Zane. That was a really great uh, closing and, and obviously call to action because there's so much going on right now. Um, I see that there are there is like one question right now in Stack, uh, which is great. And please continue to, to put them into the chat. But I just have uh, one or two questions for the panelists um, for discussion. Um, and then we'll definitely open it up and um, have folks ask their questions or we can just have a discussion uh, about next steps and that kind of thing. Um, but one of the questions that um, I wanted to, to sort of ask everyone is, um, you know, this, uh, you know, a lot of folks uh, might think and say, we know it's not true, but these developers and the mainstream media and the, the dominant media say, you know, gentrification is inevitable, right? Uh, this kind of development is inevitable. It's, 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 a, it's a part of evolution, right? But we know that that's not the case. And so how do we, um, and I hope that there are folks maybe on this call even, who uh, maybe know a little bit about what's going on, um, not just in Flushing in this case, but across the city, and, and maybe need that extra push uh, to actually um, really uh, get involved with the fight, right? How do we bring it beyond this virtual space, obviously, that we're in right now, but to, to really care about these issues and that there, there is something we can do about it and that we can change the trajectory um, of this uh, of the fight and to fight for our future in our cities. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to sort of, you know, take on that question or respond um, in some way to that, this, this idea of, you know, sort of, this is the inevitable, you know, this dominant narrative that's, that's constantly out there, right? That what can we do? Um, um, can I yeah, take please. a step? I mean, I think that what I tried to show in my presentation is that um, nothing was really inevitable without kind of very specific state actions and policies that enabled, 
you know, enabled kind of real estate speculation or was implemented in the interests of protecting real estate values or promoting real estate development. And I think that, you know, this is kind of one of the, um, the dilemmas around understanding this particular rezoning is because, or special district, is because the developers are, are saying that they can do something as of right, you know, so that, and this is how I think the many of the electeds kind of capitulate it to the developers and to the unions is that they're saying they bought into that. They're saying, well, these developers as of right could build a C42, you know, a big uh, development, but, you know, but because um, of this, a special district and rezoning, we basically were able to extract some concessions from them. And honestly, the concessions weren't even that great. And honestly, if we were really going to extract, I mean, anyway, so with that, I think that we, we, we have to understand that there's really nothing natural about that because these developers can't actually maximize their development rights or the profits on this property, on their properties without city actions without waivers and without exemptions and without flexibility around the zoning. So, um, and so it means that, you know, and I'm glad to hear that the city council is gonna be added on to the lawsuit because I think that in this particular uh, rezoning, there is such a long history that really shows the complicity of of public actors and local development corporations and EDC with the private developers to advance their interests. So. Great, thank you. Um, does anybody else wanna chime in on that? I'll just give a pause. I know Zoom is so weird. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm gonna move on to sort of um, another question, which I think all of you touched on, uh, but since uh, you know um, Sarah and Bobby and Sine, you're on the ground, if you can speak to this uh, question right now of, um, I think uh, the everyday person may not know that these re rezonings across the city are, trying, are happening at, at like neck breaking speed. They're trying to ram this down our throats um, and there's resistance like we see in Sunset Park and, and how people just flooded um, the hearing, uh, which was amazing, and they had to eventually pull out of expansion industry city. That is, but what are we? What are you guys seeing in terms of like the reality of how this uh, pandemic is really impacting people's everyday lives? Um, you know, we know that the eviction moratorium is going to end. Um, we know that you know rent. rent people, I don't know what they estimate, but I, I saw a stat from one of the housing rights groups that like thousands and thousands of people are going to be facing eviction, right? Because they can't pay the rent; they lost their work. So um, I know Bobby, if you can speak to Bobby, I know you spoke to this a little bit, what you're seeing on the ground, um, doing all of the work that you're doing, the food pantry and what you witnessed. I, um, I believe Tari wrote an article about this, the, the increase of homeless folks. So if you can, uh, houseless folks, if you can speak to that a little bit, that would be great. So like when, when I work on the line in the food pantry, I actually speak to the people and they'll tell you about them not being able not only to buy food, but they can't pay the rent. And they worry about what's gonna to happen to their kids. It's, it's weird when you can't help people, you just have to just listen. I know people have been talking about, even in the bland where we are, a lot of people there, talk about not being able to afford the rent because they didn't work for a while. The same thing with a lot of the younger folks on the line. The, the, a lot of the Latino men were waiters in restaurants. The same thing for a lot of the Asian young men and women. They'll tell you like they, they, were, they were working in bars. They were like cleaning, cleaning stuff in the restaurants and they tell you they they haven't worked for a while so i know the moratorium on the rent is is going on but people are still scared you talk to them and they'll ask you what can they do and you just have to tell them to stay in the apartment 
and then they'll tell you, but the landlord is is trying to get them out. And so it's 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 not a great sight to just tell people you just gotta hold on and have faith that the the governors will do something. But what what we do is we actually have like a newsletter sometimes and we tell the people to call the governor and ask him to cancel the rent. That's all we do. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to um, address that question, Sine or Sarah? I know Sine, you've been also in the front lines um, working with a lot of the tenants who are, you know, rent burden was already a huge issue before and I can't even imagine now. Um, um, would you mind repeating the question one more time? Yeah, it was just a really about this pandemic and you, right. you all are on the ground. And this week, I know in particular, has been intense, but just to see the viciousness of how the city and these developers are responding with trying to ram this down our, our people's throats while 99% of people are actually suffering 10 times, you know, yeah. what they were before the pandemic with tenant. I mean, sorry, rent burden and everything I know uh, being being a huge concern and even more so now. And I know you all in Minkwan are, are seeing that on the ground, doing all the work that you're doing with tenants. Yeah, definitely. Um, the one thing that's really upsetting to me and like a lot of other tenants um, is that despite the pandemic, you know how the city, <laughs> their, their government is so... Um, uh, yeah, it, so like, you know, how we're demanding canceling the rent and we want to have extended moratorium and um, we want to have, you know, housing vouchers so that uh, homeless brothers and sisters have homes to stay. We, we're, we have been, you know, asking that, but they haven't been adequately responding. But you know, MCI's major capital improvement. So this, I don't know if folks know what it is, but um, this is the way that the rent stabilized apartment get, you know, they increase um, the rent. They would do huge repairs um, um, or like roof or facade, uh, elevator, lobby work. And then they, they the, the landlord would put the cost, they divide the cost and then they put the cost to the tenants. So the tenants are paying for that construction job. So people have been getting MCI letters throughout pandemic. Um, and some people have to renew their their um, their lease and the landlord, predatory landlord would give them really, really hard time to renew it. Um, and they would intend, we, uh, it's, you know, like they would, they would really, really make people uh, get really hard um, to renew the to, to renew their lease by by just harassing them um, so there are a lot of issues that we were going through and and we wanted to have um, tenant association meeting but you know zoom or other virtual platform like it's extremely hard for many many people so um, that also has, has been the hurdle, like how do we meet? So like we had to like call individual tenants one by one, and group them together in a way that it makes sense for individuals. So it's been really difficult. Yeah. And Eddie, can I also mm, comment about this? I, I think that um, actually the pandemic is being used as a rationale to kind of ram in these rezonings. I mean, it was certainly used in the case of the industry city rezoning when, um, you know, even though after Carlos Menchaca, uh, uh, you know, expressed his opposition to the rezoning because the discussions with about the community benefits agreement with the industry city uh, wasn't going to result, you know, in community benefits. Um, or maybe whatever, but you know he came out and said no, and 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 then that kind of catalyzed a bunch of his colleagues to basically ignore the the tradition of member deference, 
and you know pen op-eds and then come out um, saying that because of the pandemic, the significance of the industry city development um, uh, rezoning was not just relevant to Sunset Park, but to the city overall, because it was going to create jobs, it was going to generate tax revenues, all of which were desperately needed to help the city recover from the economic fallout of the pandemic. And in part, you know, the this South, this um, a special Flushing Waterfront District, uh, you know, was also part of, you know, that kind of framing. And um, I think the union opposition was a, a key factor in the delay in the subcommittee votes, but ultimately because a deal was struck with the unions, the construction unions and the um, um, 32BJ, they then, you know, um, it was then feasible for the electeds to say, well, you know, this is going to create good jobs. We're going to have good paying jobs in Flushing. Um, and um, so I think the pandemic is, is kind of used as an excuse to kind of expedite, you know, uh, these, um, these rezonings. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thanks for that, Tari. Um, did, Sarah, did you have anything you want to add? Or? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it's also being used. Um, I really agree with Terry, but I also think to accelerate the displacement um, as well, right? So, you know, I think you also see this really, you know, we sometimes joke at the worker center that, you know, COVID was the best thing for these developers, right? Trying really hard to get out working people, get out small businesses. You really see that taking place in Flushing. What is the incentive for the city then that has been aiding these developers and taking over our communities? There is no incentive to provide relief. There is no incentive to, to provide, you know, the things that, you know, working people and small businesses need to survive this pandemic, right? So, I mean, I don't know hard facts. I don't know, you know, studies, but I would love to see, you know, I sometimes also notice in Flushing when I'm walking, you know, to and from work, the, you know, certain blocks, it's all for rent, right? Um, other blocks, you know, doing maybe a little bit better, right? But we also know that there's, you know, really um, certain areas that are being really eyed by the developers, right? They really want to. So then, you know, of course, then these landlords are not going to um, help, not going to work with the businesses, right? To um, help them overcome, you know, the the, the months. Um, I also want to speak to the the jobs thing that you mentioned, Tari, because it really was also very upsetting to us, right? Particularly for the city council to take that kind of um, position, um, you know. Uh, and there was also, you know, these business leaders in our community that were organizing, you know, working people or, or you know, a, a, and a lot of business owners too to say, oh, you know, the, we need jobs, we need jobs, you know. Uh, you know, the majority of our community works in small businesses. I think New York City wide, the, the percentage is over 50%, right? Um, you know, we cannot wait a year or two for these developments to happen. And for a lot of these jobs, that won't even be going to our community. So, you know, I think it really goes down to, uh, you know, whose interests does, does the city represent, right? And it actually kind of connects to the first, the inevitability question too, right? I think there is a very clear uh, way in which the city government, um, you know, definitely under the de Blasio administration, but you know, before as well, has really helped um, to, to uh, really do the bidding of the developers, right? And really only speak for their interests. And so, you know, Anessa, I'm, I'm kind of a newcomer to this fight. You know, I learned a lot from, you know, Sane actually organized us into this and learned a lot from Bobby and Tari and all of them, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it really, um, you know, we, I remember talking in the beginning, you know, who do we target? Do we target the developers or do we target the council member? And we were all like, no, because the count, you know, we have to target Ku because he is at least supposed to be speaking for the interests of working, you know, of, of the constituents, right, of people. And I think that you see is happening citywide as well. So I think it's really important that we, um, yeah, use uh, the, the months coming up, use the upcoming election, use these things to really, um, you know, say, you know, enough, right? We, we need, um, we need, our, you know, the city government, we need our officials to really, um, you know, speak for, represent the interest um, of us. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a perfect segue, perfect moment to um, 
uh, get into questions um, that folks might have. And we've got a, a good 30 minutes to um, get into a discussion, have folks answer, uh, ask questions. I think there are a few in the, in the chat already. I'm gonna pass it on to Lindsay from Queens Museum who can help with um, uh, calling on folks. And if you wanna uh, unmute yourself, um, but I'll, I'll just pass it to uh, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you, Betty, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, it's been an amazing conversation. Um, I'm going to call on um, folks in the order that I received them. I also noticed some folks have raised hands, so I will definitely, I'm also doing those in the order, just FYI. Um, and I think, you know, we are asking if folks are open to it, to, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question um, you have. If for some reason you want me to read it, I'm happy to. Um, but there is, I think Tom is one of the first ones to ask a question, if you want to unmute yourself. Tom Devaney. Oh, maybe I'm happy. Would, yeah, I'm happy to ask yeah. it. Um, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and the question was, even if a full EIS is done, um, do you really think it would change the city council's decision? So that wasn't addressed to anyone in particular, but anyone can feel free to jump in. And that's an environmental impact study, just to break down the acronym. Um. Can I go? <laughs> okay. Yes, please. <laughs> so um, I understand that a lot of other groups have different opinions of EIS. That you know, EIS, some you know, some neighborhoods that I have been talked to, talking to, um, said that EIS doesn't help, right? But what really, what's really insulting to Flushing community is that we didn't even have it, right? We didn't, this for the scale of this development, um, 11 block, 29 acres, we don't even have it. And it wasn't even, it was an error, right? So because, because of the rear address, we're doing the lawsuit, suing the mayor's agencies that they don't even explain it just came out of nowhere, you know, when you do, and there are, sign, there are some other groups that used the environmental impact study period as a way that they addressed the issues in the community and the impact, the negative impacts in the community that will, that, that the rezoning will bring. So they were able to um, stop the rezoning, right? So we are upset that that opportunity wasn't given to us. We are very unhappy with how the, the city has been treating us. They have been just muting us. They just have been, um, you know, didn't let us know when the plan, uh, when the when the when the Department of City Planning started this plan. They didn't let us know. It was without community input. Period. That made us really upset. Um, and I just want to mention that we had really, really good uh, volunteers um, and they're like professional um, people. They, they reviewed the environmental um, EAS. Um, sorry, all of a sudden on top of my head, <laughs> it's, it's not blinking, it's not clicking the, the actual word um, EAS. Um, they were able to review the EAS, which is not EIS, but they were saying that the EAS that developers have put together, which it, it, it's not really about, it's it's really irrelevant. It, there is nothing we can just see and, you know, gain gain any knowledge because it's it's not comparing the, the, you know, what will happen when they do the rezoning versus what, what if it doesn't happen? What what if um they don't build this rezoning versus it's not like sorry, I'm just like it's hard to explain, but um it's not comparing the scenario where they they wouldn't build this the seventeen twenty five luxury condos and eleven block rezoning versus um they're not doing it at all or they are doing it. They're just comparing whether they get they they are gonna build the rezoning, um, and the scenario in the in the EIS is that they are going to build the rezoning, and then what benefits or they will get from that 
that rezoning if they do the re I'm sorry, it's hard to explain, but EAS doesn't make sense. Professor Hum, please jump on. No, I, I just wanted to underscore, Sonne, that um, how, um, you know, DCP and the developers had worked so closely on this proposal that, uh, you know, when um, the plan was certified, I think that there were members of the community board, John, I'm gonna kind of call you out, <laughs> but John Chose is, um, sits on the community board and didn't and did not even know that this plan was going to be uh, certified, which meant starting, you know, the ULERT clock. So the sense of exclusion, exclusion of what Peter Ku called agitators today, you know, he called anyone that opposed this development or raised concerns about it as, prov as uh, providing misleading information or agitators. The fact that an EIS would have involved more public hearings, would have involved more opportunity for the community to at least chime in about this. But you know, given the scale of it, it's a 29 acre site. I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable that, um, that it didn't trigger an EIS. And it was just a technicality based on um, the lawsuit, as I understand it, that the incremental increase in new development based on the build out of the existing zoning was not significant enough to trigger an EIS. But when you're talking about, you know, waiving height limits <laughs> for 13, ta for 11 towers, um, you know, it's kind of insane. And all the fact that it's in a floodplain zone, there is absolutely no addressing any resiliency, any kind of, you know, anything um, uh, around the issues of the environmental conditions of the brownfield plan or the remediation that's going to take place or ne is necessary for the Flushing Creek, et cetera. It's outrageous. And it really excluded those people that I think based on maybe a uh, some um, experience around the Flushing West rezoning, which it's, they're related, but they're not the same thing. When a lot of community people, you know, were involved and made it very clear, you know, that, that um, the rezoning was not going to, was basically going to supercharge the gentrification of Flushing and was not going to meet the needs or the interests of uh, the community, which is still largely a working class diverse community. Should we move to the next yeah. question? Thank you, um, definitely. So I wanna call on next and please do correct my pronunciation if it's incorrect, um, Wallis, um, you had your hand raised. If you'd like to unmute and ask your question, you're welcome to. Hi, yeah, I, I, uh, I raised my hand. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this situation is, you know, so familiar, but um, thank you for the presentations. And um, I just wanna say my personal history, I mean, it's out there, but I spent the first seven years of my life in Flushing and I went to Macedonia, AME Church um, for a little bit of that time. And so I remember, um, I remember, you know, what the community was like. And I lived in, my family lived in public housing in Pominock, which, you know, which is, you know, close to Queens College and, you know, <laughs> Um, and um, so, so I have, you know, great familiarity or some familiarity. I mean, I don't remember at all, but, but I have a history with this. I have a history with, um, with this community. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about, I had a couple of questions. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Um, uh, I, um, I, 
First off, I, I wanted to talk about um, global capital because um, it does seem like there's so much of this story that's hidden behind, you know, that's behind all of this, you know, local discussion is, you know, the, the interest of global capital. In particular, um, capital comes from China and Hong Kong and um, all of these places, because I don't think this would happen without that interest. Um, and, um, and so, you know, with all that money floating around the world and floating around New York City, um, you know, flushing seems ripe for this kind of development. So I, I, I wonder if, if you guys have made that connection, you know, um, and can speak to that. And then um, also, um, because the push is coming from out, not only from within the community, but from outside the country, outside the city, um, outside of the community. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing I wanted to talk about, or I had a question about is just Black Lives Matter. You know, we saw these protests and you know, one of the things that, um, you know, really interests me about all of these demonstrations and the kind of intersectionality, if you will, um, around these discussions of inequality, of police, of, of um, you know, community control, of um, you know the history of the United States and discrimination against all different kinds of people, including especially Asians and other people of color and uh, Black people. Um, you know the pandemic, environmental racism, you know educational opportunities like all of these seem to be connected. And what always somewhat disheartens me is that um, people, you know, that we atomize this one issue. And of course you don't want it to, to um, you don't want these issues to uh, be diluted, but they are all connected. And this idea, especially going back to the history of this community, that the enclosure of redlining also has to do with the exclusion of people within the broader context of um, America and this city in terms of how it picks and chooses who's gonna get the resources. So, um, <clears throat> So I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, but um, maybe, maybe you can speak to that, I don't know. Wow, yeah. I mean, I think you raised two really important points. Um, and I, I think that the role of transnational capital, um, especially after the 2008, Great Recession that you know and the housing crisis or the housing finance crisis um, is kind of a turning point with respect to the volume of global capital that we see uh, financing a lot of real estate development in New York City. I mean, remember Hudson Yards, um, you know that huge Bloomberg legacy new neighborhood, the platform that enables those tall towers to be constructed was financed through EB-5 money, which is a underutilized up until 2008, you know, immigration category um, for, to encourage employment, to encourage immigrants, you know, with skills or with resources, uh, you know, to, to immigrate to the United States. So um, at that time, you know, you could invest $500,000 in a, um, a business venture a development, and many of them were commercial real estate development sites. 
uh, projects and you can get a green card for yourself and members of your family. So that's prefer a preference, you know, for uh, immigrant investors. There was a lot of that. Um, and a lot of that money, you know, uh, is in New York City. And it also kind of um, underscores this really class, increasing class bifurcation among Chinese immigrants. So that you have super affluent, but then you also have a really, you know, a working poor. Um, so absolutely, transnational capital, really integral, Bloomberg, you know, welcomed it, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, actually a lot of their <laughs> uh, renovation was financed uh, with EB-5 money. Um, around Black Lives Matter, um, I have to say that I think that um, over the summer, you know, there were definitely um, actions that took place in downtown Flushing. And I, and, and I know that there are some members of, of this um, uh, uh, group, you know, who participated in supporting Black Lives Matter's um, um, actions by holding them in, in Flushing. And so at some points they were countering uh, Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, you know, protests that were being organized by members, I have to say, of this immigrant growth coalition. So, you know, in one of the, and, and it's tied into kind of a rising Chinese conservatism that I think is very directly tied to this, this, uh, this kind of idealizing of meritocracy. And it is all wrapped up with their anti-Bloomberg, uh, not Bloomberg, de Blasio uh, efforts to kind of, uh, uh, to make changes with regard to the special admissions, uh, the admissions to the specialized high schools. So they wanna protect this meritocracy, you know, that, that privileges, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, of Asian American students. And um, I think that that's also tied in to this kind of uh, sense of entrepreneurship and business success and whatever. I mean, I, so that is, that's a challenge, I think, within the Asian American community. I think that um, it's something that, you know, we need to, we need to address, but I think that these developers, in fact, you know, at least one of them was very vocal at a uh, All Lives Matter or police, police and supporting NY in front of the Flushing Library um, over the summer. So. Just I don't I don't know if that's an answer, but it's a, an acknowledgement that absolutely these these are complicated, but but that's that's the condition, and that's part of this kind of context of the influx of 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 transnational wealth, of kind of privileging you know private property you know rights and private development. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, on an organizing front, I mean, just, you know, in terms of, you know, recent immigrants not really knowing necessarily the history of this country and, you know, the way these acts, you know, these uh, various acts, Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, redlining, you know, the whole gamut is really geared toward um, creating these enclosures that exclude, right, that are that are racially and ethnically discriminatory. And then when that changes, it becomes an exclusionary zone where you get to exclude everybody. And that these things have um, ramifications that go sort of beyond kind of black identity politics or whatever, that that this is this is how it works, you know? And I would, you know, I'd be really heartened if I saw some real discussion of this kind of historical context that that goes beyond just, oh, this is our community. And, you know, and I think some of that really actually happened on this talk, but, um, you know, and I, it's so great to hear, but to get people to really talk about the nuts and bolts of the history. But can I just say, I'm sorry, if 
I might be out of place just to, to chime in that when I interviewed Bobby and Sine, uh for the for the video that's uh, that is is in the um, show, they did talk about, and I think Bobby, you might have spoken to this. It's um, the increase of police, uh, you know, police presence and surveillance. Uh -huh. And it's and by design that's not there to protect the longtime residents uh -huh. or or the folks in the the bland houses and the NYCHA housing across the street from the huge Skylight Mall. It's all really designed there to really protect the newcomers, right? The the gentrifiers that that look like me actually, like in Sunset Park, are the all the developers who are uh, we me and, and Tari were talking the other day. All the people developing Sunset Park on the Chinatown side are all from they're Flushing based. And they're transnational from China, so um, they all look like me, actually. Uh, but anyway, just to say that um, that I know that that is a part of the discussions, and I know that Sine and Bobby and some folks, maybe John, you were there, but the Black Lives Matter, I believe there was a protest, um, and that was in response to the Blue Lives Matter that was happening in Flushing. I think it was a big march in Flushing for of cops for cops, like a couple weeks before that. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it would just be great to get on the same page with all this stuff because I think it is connected, right? It's never not connected. Thank you so much. Um, does it, do any of the other panelists have any response to that or I can get to the next question? Okay, great. Um, so our next question is um, Jeremy who is asking a bit more about transportation. Jeremy, would you like to read your question aloud or should I go ahead? Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and find this question. Um, so Jeremy asks, is there any talk of an investment in public transportation for downtown Flushing? If that many new condos are built by the waterfront, transportation system will be overwhelmed. So during the, the, the hearing at Community Board 7, I had raised the issue that we're the, really building the, the new site. There's, it's not accessible by public transportation and what they would do to enhance the public bus system. Because I mentioned that the 58 bus is like five, four blocks away from there. And then it's, it's not really much public accessibility to the, to the site by the bus system here in Flushing because almost everything is on Main Street and they, 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 had, they didn't have an answer for me. Thanks, Bobby, yeah. Um, and then I think this will be our last question of the evening um, from Brian, um, who, I, Brian, do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yeah, so I live in Flushing. Uh, and have gone to school here in New York City for my whole life and now go to Stai. I just wanted to ask, so being involved with Min Kwan, what I've seen from the opposing side is that the special waterfront development really seems to exclude a lot of Spanish speakers or just a more diverse set uh, of community members from what I've seen at their counter protests. And they seem to be really small and performative, like they're there for a little bit. And then the moment the other protest leaves, it's just like they go or it's, there's like a time limit and that they don't and that um, within these developers, the people who they include in their conversations, it really doesn't seem to be anyone that looks like me or other people in the community and that most of their signage even is in Chinese and English. Um, and just another question that I had is like being here for so long, what I'm increasingly seeing getting more involved in this work is that it's seemingly becoming a crime to be poor here. And I just wanted to hear what were, what are the thoughts of someone like Terry or just local residents like Bobby on either of these two questions? I'm sorry, was Tari? Did you mean me, Brian? Terry, Terry. yeah, yeah. Tari. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay. It happens all the time. Um, well, you know, I actually, um, um, some of the classes that I teach are, are kind of community based research classes. And so, um, and in fact, that's probably the first way that I got involved 
uh, with some of the community organizations in Flushing. Um, and one of the first groups that I got involved with was the Min Kwan Center. And actually, um, one of the last protests that I was able to join in, you know, so pre pandemic, but centered all around the tenant protection laws, you know, that were being debated in, um, uh, in Albany was how um, it was the first protest that I had ever gone to in which we chanted in four different languages. We chanted in English, we chanted in Spanish, then we chanted in Korean, and then we chanted in Mandarin, and then in Cantonese. So it was five different languages and it was amazing. And I think that it was really important that we had that at that time that um, uh, Wilfredo Benitez, who was um, the father at St. George's Church was the leader and really acknowledged that Flushing is a very multilingual, multiracial, multi-ethnic um, neighborhood the dominant narrative that it is largely Chinese. And, and it was in that space because he provided that space um, and the leadership of Min Kwan that recognizes, you know, the multi, the, all of the different stakeholders in this community that, um, and it was reflected in who participated, who was brought in to that organizing effort. And we had such a glorious march down to the um, waterfront uh, where I um, because of the rising rents. So, you know, um, so they, they really kind of hit home, just like the video of um, the homeless Chinese man that died a couple of weeks ago. I mean, the human cost of what is happening in, in Flushing is really real, despite all of this glassy towers that are going around and the fancy retail. Um, there was recently the anniversary uh, commemoration of the death of Yang Song, who is a sex worker in downtown, in downtown Flushing and was uh, being harassed and pursued by the police. So these are all the, the human stories that are just there. They're not covered in the press. They're not covered, you know, whatever. The, Peter Ku doesn't ever talk about them. But those are the everyday lives and people that are just trying to survive, you know, um, in downtown Flushing. So, and um, I know that my experience with Min Kwan always was that Min Kwan had that vision of what Flushing was, which is very multi-ethnic, multilingual, and the organizing had to be in that form too. Does anybody else wanna chime in? I think if not with that, I might pass it to Betty um, to close us out and just wanna say personally, um, thank you so much to everyone, to our panelists and folks who ask questions for this discussion. Um, but Betty, go ahead. Yeah, actually, um, I wanted to give a chance for all the panelists if they have any parting words or anything, especially given um, this week as a uh, so much going on right this week with the vote. So um, why don't we start? So with... raise her hand. Oh, 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 yeah. Did you want to answer the question? Uh, I just want to clarify one thing really quick. Uh, oh. So what I was trying to say about EAS um, was that EAS only compares the impact of the development with no rezoning versus with rezoning, not like now versus what happens if the development happens. So just <laughs> wanted to share oh, that. That's important, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, did you have any parting words? Uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna just go around and ask. Yeah, everybody. thank you so much, um, Queen Museum and Betty for really um, making the time for us to talk about this alarming issues um, and making the floor in time and bring us together really um this isn't i just really really wanted to ask people that this isn't just about my me like right this isn't just about flushing it's it's about us it's our fight we it's if, if it's an hour if it's our fight we really have to come together and fight together and i wanted to say that 
Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you have any parting remarks? Um, no, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Queens Museum. Thank you, Betty, for moderating. Um, I'm also a little brain dead, um, so and it has been a long day. I want to say I, I, I really also wanted to continue conversations. Um, Wallace, I wanted to also address your question, which but I, my brain couldn't actually bring it all together. Um, but I think just to echo what Sana was saying, you know, the um, you know, I really don't see this as, um, you know, the end of the rezoning fight, but it's, you know, we have so much more organizing to do and of bringing our community together um, to, um, you know, to protect our community, to fight for all the things that, you know, we need in, in our community. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know if uh, you're sharing along with our bios, but like contact information and such like that, but, um, you know, I welcome anyone to reach out to continue any of these conversations. And thanks again, everyone. Great, thank you. Um, and Tari, did you wanna say anything for closing? Same here, thank you very much to you, Betty, um, uh, for your artistic vision and your passion and your activism. Thank you for the Queen's Museum. Um, and uh, it's really been an honor and a privilege to work with these amazing organizers, including yourself. And the fight is not over. Um, so please stay tuned to, um, you know, Fed Up, Fada, Min Kwan, and get involved. Thank you. Great. And last but certainly not least, Bobby, do you uh, have any parting words for us? Uh, I just want to say thank you to the people from the Queen's Museum. Thank you for allowing us to, to feed the people in your parking lot from Corona, because we also feed the people in Corona as well. Uh, thank you to Professor Humps. You know, she's my superhero. Uh, I just want to say I grew up in a city that there were only five people of color on the city council. And we actually fought in these streets to change it. We joined with uh, Dr. Esmeralda Simmons and Richard Emery to actually take the, the city council to court. And we won that lawsuit. So this is why now we have a council of 50, 51 uh, council members and uh, majority people of color. If we didn't agitate, uh, Peter Cool would never have a job on the city council today. Uh, there's a but a little bit before Frederick Douglass died, he was asked, what would he say to a young black person? And Frederick Douglass' word was agitate, agitate, agitate. And so this is my thing to the young people, especially the young people uh, that joined us from FADA, the people, the beautiful people as well from Fed Up, and the young people from Ming Kwan Yu. I say, you just gotta keep fighting Agitate, agitate, agitate. Thank you. Amazing. It's hard to follow you, Bobby, but I'm gonna try and just say thank you. I don't know if you're seeing all the, the thank yous in the chat. Um, really appreciate it. And I put uh, again the um, link to Fada um, in, in the chat. You know, I'm sure you all know you can save the chat actually if you want with all the links um, by hitting the three swiggly lines next to file on the chat function. Um, I also added the, the video that the Flushing Workers Center produced, as well as the videos featuring Sine and Bobby and their personal stories connected to the larger fight. I also put in there, um, you can uh, please, please, please take a moment to write your city council before December 10th, uh, the vote tomorrow, I put a link in there that, you know, uh, the coalitions all created these sort of direct links to send a, a letter. It took me two seconds literally to do it to my city council member. Um, and then finally, Sine mentioned the December 16th um, uh, uh, press conference at City Hall at 12 o'clock on the, on the 16th, I believe. And, and really, I think we will send a follow-up maybe email to everyone if everyone wants to um, find out more. And uh, we'll, we'll actually also, if it's okay with the folks here, I think we can also share, anyway, email addresses um, with, with, with the organizers. So keep you all uh, posted. And I have to say that there was very little drop off after, you know, at the end of this call and it's 8.32 right now. So thank you guys, it's full two hours of a really rich conversation. So thank you, thank you. And um, we'll see you all really, really soon. Much appreciation to everyone. Have a good night.
Thank you, Betty. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone.